All right, good evening. I'm so glad to be here tonight. I'm so glad it's Monday night. We have an incredible show. Our show is it's all about the business tonight, and that's the business and network marketing with nine at night.com. And I'm Christine Campbell, the host. Every weekday night from Monday through Friday, we have incredible topics. We have wonderful guests from all around the country, very exper experienced and specialized in their field. And so when it comes to it's all about the business, we're going to have topics tonight discussed about a home-based business and the benefits of it. We're going to kick off with our CPA, Richard Bruff, and he's absolutely phenomenal with that, as well as with our uh, coach, he uh, coaches with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a whole slew of others, and that's Chris Lashemanot. But right now, let's get started. Tonight, um, each one of us are going to kind of give our take of why a home-based business. And so just kind of think about that. If you're not, if you've never considered that before, it's something that there's all backup residuals. Everybody can use something and in case uh, emergencies happen. And so that's why we feel this is a very special topic to discover and to talk about. So with that, I'm going to introduce our, our first guest. And he's my co-host. His name is Richard Ruff, as I mentioned before. And he has a ton of uh, background when it comes to making a positive difference. He graduated Akum Delata with a Bachelor of Arts degree in accounting with minors in business, administration, and Mandarin Chinese. He spent well over 35 years helping small and home-based business owners increase their profits while helping them on taxes. And most of those years were also spent as financial auditor, which provides Richard with a thorough understanding of how an auditor thinks. He travels um, all around the country presenting workshops for the home-based business industry. So he definitely knows the importance importance and the benefits of having a home-based business. He has also listed, is also listed in publications such as the National Dean's List, America's Registry of Outstanding Professionals, Montclair Who's Who Among Executives and Professionals, and the in International Who's Who of Entrepreneurs. And so uh, my pleasure greatly to, to welcome Richard Ruff. We're so glad that you're here tonight, Richard. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for that great introduction. As always, I appreciate it. I really appreciate you putting together this platform to help people every Monday be successful in their home-based business. Um, I, you know, we've talked a little bit about multiple streams of income and why that's important, residual income, and it's all important. But another very important benefit of having a home-based business is taxes. So money that you're spending right now anyway can be converted into tax-deductible business expenses. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about um, paying family members, such as your children, your spouse wages, uh, ways to make your mileage on your vehicle deductible and be able to deduct that. We've talked about uh, some of your travel expenses, making those business travels so you can get tax deductions for it. You know, the list goes on and on. Um, and the benefits from a tax standpoint of having a home-based business. As a matter of fact, in my mind, it's almost, uh, it's crazy not to have a home-based business, just from the tax aspects of things. And tonight, for my little tax tidbit, if you want to call it, I'd like to talk about maybe thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, and that is donations. Okay, a lot of my clients, they're very, they're charitable, they're giving, they give donations. However, donations are not a business deduction. And uh, anymore, you may not be able to deduct them even as what's called an itemized deduction. But if you can convert those donations into legitimate business advertising, expenses, then it's fully deductible as a business expense. Let me give you just a slight example of what I'm talking about. Um, every year, our church has a bake sale to raise funds for something, okay, for the youth, for whatever it is. And my wife and I go over and support that. And we'll always buy, you know, that, that $100 plate of cookies, okay? That's not advertising, that's a donation. I do not get to deduct that. However, What's if instead of buying that plate of cookies, I could do something that would be counted as advertising? Maybe I talk to them about sponsoring the, so if they do flyers, maybe on the flyer, I can have my website put on that flyer and I give them $100 to do that. Well, I've contributed the $100, they benefited from that, but now it's an advertising expense for me. Maybe they would let me put some business cards on a table or a small banner up, things like that. Now it's gotten to be tax deductible business expense 
And the nonprofit has actually gotten more money. They got my hundred dollars I was going to give them anyway. Plus they still have that plate of cookies that they can sell, which I may buy for a hundred dollars. Cookies are, are kind of my weakness. Okay. And so that's one thing to consider. Now also interest on your credit cards. A lot of people use credit cards. They'll, they'll co-mingle, we call it, but they'll use the same credit card for personal expenses as well as business expenses. Well, that's not deductible. How much that interest is for business, how much of it is for personal. And personal interest paid on credit cards is not deductible. However, if they can clean up a credit card and use it specifically and only for business, now that same interest is a business deduction and you'll get that write off for it. Now, every week I put in something about my financial literacy program and that's where I'm gonna put it in right now. And that is because uh, hopefully you don't have to carry interest over and pay interest on those credit cards. But if you do, let's at least make it tax deductible. Um, so Christine, that's all I wanted to kind of mention for tonight for the tax tidbit is just emphasize the importance of the benefits of the home-based business from a tax standpoint and maybe think outside the box a little bit on, on expanding what's deductible. Well, you know, what's really good about your topic is that people don't know by working a regular job as an employee, they have the W-2s that they get, but they can't deduct any deductions. And so let's talk briefly about why the benefit of a home-based business compared to working for somebody else on, concerning on taxes and deductions. Yeah, like you mentioned, the W-2 employee, I have a couple clients that all they have is their W-2. And in doing their taxes, I really feel handcuffed. There's absolutely nothing we can do as far as getting some tax deductions for them. Even if they pay expenses on behalf of their employer, that's no longer deductible. So there's just nothing they can do. And quite honestly, they're a frustrating tax return to do for me because I feel totally helpless. If we can bring in some sort of a home-based business, now, a lot of the miles they're putting on their car that they're driving anyway, we can convert that into business miles. Some of the traveling that they do. Um, we've talked about the home office deduction. Maybe they can write off a portion of their, their mortgage or their rent, you know, their utilities, those things. If you have an area in your home that you use exclusively for business, we can get those write-offs. The list, the list is just never ending almost of things, benefits you can have on those tax write-offs from having a home-based business it's simply not available to anybody with just a W-2. And when we talk about home-based business, we're talking the same word as network marketing and uh, multi-level marketing, but, and it's all the same and encompasses that, but basically every company, I have a book I've written, but it talks about mainly the, what you should look for in a company. It doesn't talk at all about my own personal company I'm involved with, but uh, you know, things that you should look for when looking at a network marketing company. So let's, let's kind of list some of those. And me, I think it's, you know, the in, in integrity of the co-founders, those that kicked it off, how long it, it was in place, you know? So what are some things that you say to look for when well, launching a company? You wanna look at the owners, okay? What type of backing do they have financially as far as experience and everything else? Um, and then who's running it? What do, the owners might be running it, um, but the, if not the people that's running it, their, their CEO, their finance people who is running that, are they gonna be around for a while, okay? You also have to take a clear look at their products, okay? And their compensation structure. Because there is there's those bad apples out there, okay? There are some direct sales companies, network marketing companies that, uh, that are pyramids, <laughs> okay? And we talk about pyramids. That's kind of my pet peeve when, oh, that's one of those pyramids. Like, yeah, every business is a pyramid. But there are illegal pyramids, Ponzi schemes, when they don't really have a legitimate product to sell. Can you so, elaborate a little bit about that, just so they know the difference between a solid home-based business network marketing to the scam pyramid? Okay. So one thing to look for is, can you sell that product to somebody who's not interested in the compensation plan? Very product-focused, okay? Um, for example, this pen right here. I could have a network marketing company selling pens like this, and I can sell them for $50 a pen. OK, um, but that might not be very that's that's probably going to be an illegal policy because I can buy this pen for 
I can buy a box of them for $1.19, okay? Um, the exact same pans. So first look at the product. Is it a product you can get into? Is it something you enjoy? I'll tell, uh, as I'm consulting with people, especially my non-business people that are just those W-2s, what are your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? Okay, because probably the odds are pretty high that there is a direct sales company that has products related to that. Who do you enjoy working with? Um, different things like that, but do they have a legitimate product that you could sell without a compensation plan? That's, you know, and that's what I really love. In fact, uh, we've had, of course, what's your passion? There's a company for everything just about. What is your passion? Is it health? Is it, you know, gold and silver? Is it, you know, there's a company for everything. And so what you're saying is that be careful of who the founders make sure the backup is. Now, some people feel they need to be in a company that's been at least 10 years established. And my feelings are, if you check them out, you want to get in as early as you can. I mean, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on that. And there are so many companies that uh, go out of business, mm -hmm. not because they're a pyramid or anything, but just they don't have the right backing financially, mm -hmm. or maybe from a management standpoint. And so I like companies that have been around for a couple of years. Okay. Okay. And they've kind of got themselves established. Um, if they've been around three years, there's pretty good odds that they'll continue on. They do have that backing because what happens, they go through a rapid growth. Mm hmm and they, their cash flow just does not keep up with the growth that they're going under. And so you wanna make sure that they're, they're stable and they're gonna be around for a while. Um, but at the same time, I like them to get in early enough that you're, it's the ground floor opportunity type thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not yet a house hold world word. It hasn't gone through what they call um, momentum, which is really mm -hmm. rapid growth. Now that being said, there are companies that have been around for 30 years. They're still very good companies. There's still a good opportunity there. And so uh, a lot of people, like I say, my opinion, there's a lot of opinions. Mine is I like for them to be around for a few years. Um, now, the company that I'm with, I got in with them before they were even legally a company. They didn't have a bank account set up. But, but you they, knew the co-founders. But I met the co-founders personally mm -hmm. and interviewed them. I'm an auditor, as you mentioned. So I came home, did some due diligence, looked into their backgrounds and stuff and thought, yeah, these guys can do it. And their product happens to be something that I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Now, I saw, I love this poster I saw because I want to get back to the pyramid scheme, but they had the triangle and they had a regular company. And it said at the, the CEO will never teach you all of his business. The vice president will never show you what he does either. And so it goes down to a regular structured company is where as in home-based businesses, they want you to learn as much as the CEO just because, and they have the, every company has incredible education because that's how they teach so that you don't have to pay money to go to college to get a degree to do a home-based business. You just follow the business plan and their education uh, that each one has. And so with that, you do learn to make as much, even more than the CEO, if you put in that effort. Do you agree with that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you look at every business, every business that has more than two people involved mm -hmm. is structured as a pyramid. Like you said, so let's take a traditional business where you have the CEO, mm -hmm. you've got vice presidents, you have regional directors, you have, you have uh, local directors, you've got you know, that pyramid structure. But here's the thing, the people that punt pyramid mm -hmm. will never make more than the people above them. The, uh, the Walmart greeter is never gonna make as much money as the store manager, as a department manager, who's not gonna make as much as a store manager, who's not gonna make as much as a regional manager. And so far on up to that top of the pyramid. In direct sales, a guy that comes in today can be making more than the people that's been in for 20 years, you know? And so ironically, there's more opportunities in my opinion in the direct sales industry or mm -hmm. network marketing for the average guy to make more than the people that's been around for a long time. 
Well, and not only that, I mean, you're, you own yourself. You can set your own hours, your own times. Now, my husband right now, we love what we're doing because we like to prioritize our time together alone. Plus, we are wanting to just really build and do some great things. So we get up at five in the morning and we have from five to eight o'clock our time where we do our exercise, we we do a bunch of uh, learning together, talking things out, getting our day planned out and we love it. It's our day in the morning. And then what happens is that it just goes ahead and uh, the rest of the day he's doing his thing, I'm doing mine and we meet at night. So it's just a wonderful balance. So you can actually balance your family with this business too. And then you can just take off and do what you want to do if you want to go fishing or something in the morning. Exactly. exactly. But I will say this, it does require a lot more self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, your W-2 job, you've got that, you, you've got that accountability. Right. If you don't show up for work, you're going to get fired. Okay. Yeah. And so in direct sales, you need a little bit more, a, a lot more self-discipline, have accountability people that you're working with that will make you accountable and, uh, and just make sure you show up for work. OK, on a consistent basis. And that's the learning curve is learning how to do it. And I've been a home based. Well, not just network marketing, but uh, other businesses out of my home. And it's always been discipline. I was a single mom 15 years. So we had to learn that and learn how to have those priorities with everybody. But this is excellent information to share. So uh, what we're going to do is I, I want to just put up your slide, your contact information, and then we're going to go to our next guest. But what I want to do is be able to, uh, we'll all open discuss after that. So if you want to let everyone know how to get a hold of you. So yeah, yeah, feel free. My my email address is there. Feel free to reach out to me with a, if you have any questions or clarification of what I talk about. Um, I'm happy to answer it. This time of year, I might be a little bit slow getting back to you. But uh, I'm just happy. To, I, I like educating my people. My father was a teacher. I could never deal with the, with the high school kids like my father did. But I still kind of have that blood in me, maybe, as far as enjoying educating people. And so reach out to me. Don't hesitate. And I'll answer the questions you might have uh, best that I can. I should appreciate that, Richard. And we'll, we'll, uh, I'll join up right after this. Right now, I want to introduce Chris LeCheminot. And Chris, in April of 2005, Chris joined the Professional Education Institute as a personal coach for Rich Dad Licensed Accounts of Choose to be Rich, Rich Dad Real Estate, Rich Dad Franchise, and Rich Dad Entrepreneur. He also coached the Jack Canfield Success Principles in addition to other programs the company offered. So Chris has one of the highest client retention rates in the entire company. He's coached thousands of clients from over 100 countries around the world to success and personal discovery. So in 2006, Chris founded the DTE, that's Consulting and Desert Toad Expeditions, and that was established to provide independent consulting and coaching programs that combine all of the experience and resources available through experience, as well as active research and study to business owners and individuals desiring business and personal improvement. So his most powerful program is 12 Steps to Freedom and a Life Well-Lived is designed to create that crystal clear clarity so each client can follow a customized plan full of purpose and passion. So with that, I'm just so excited to introduce Chris LeShemina. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the things that's been on the minds of a lot of people lately is the uh, the word inflation, oh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and and I think part of the reason why it's on people's minds is because it's becoming very obvious that it's it's causing problems, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about inflation tonight. I know when I do the the presentation on the rich dad cash flow quadrant, I mention inflation, but I don't get into the details of it. So let's go ahead and do that now. If you wouldn't okay. mind, we'll get my, do I need to screen, share my screen or do you do that for me? I can't remember. Um, I know you go ahead and do that. Okay, great. Let me get that set up. Let's see. Let me see if I've got the right one here. Yeah, there we go. All right. So inflation, what is it all about? Well, I, one of the things that I, I thought about earlier this year, I think it was in January, um, 
a website called, uh, uh, what is it called, Visual Charts, something like that. Uh, they posted one on inflation. And, and I, and I kind of jokingly looked at that one. I said, okay, now it's getting personal because it, they listed bacon is up 20%. And, and you know, so, okay, now, now I no longer put up with it. Well, that, that's jokingly, I say that, but actually I've been very uninterested in putting up with inflation since 2008. So it's been a long time. I've been thinking about inflation and working on ways in which I can, uh, uh, not be a victim of inflation. But I do want to make sure that as we talk about inflation, that, that this is really just based on my own research and my own opinions. I don't consider myself a super smart guy, uh, but I like to follow smart people, people who get it right, and don't consider this investment advice. Everybody's situation is different. But the first thing when I think about inflation is, is the word inflation too simplified? And, and I would say, yes, it is. And the reason I say that is because I like to follow a very smart person named Jim Rickards, and he likes to talk a lot about complexity theory. In fact, when, when he uh, often cites where what should be the people that know what's going on when they get it wrong, you know, like the Federal Reserve missing all their projections and their predictions and economists way off the charts and, and uh, even in uh, political uh, circles, they often get their surveys wrong. Anyway, he, he attributes that to complexity theory, which is essentially this. There's a lot of stuff that goes into what influences how things happen. When we talk about the market, you know, the market uh, moved on this. Really what they're talking about is millions of people making individual decisions. And how do you really know what's going on? Well, I think when it comes to inflation, we're dealing with complexity theory there as well. It's not just one thing that causes inflation, it's many things. And when we understand what those many, some of those many variables are, we're better prepared for what's coming or to anticipate what's coming. So the first thing I like to talk about with inflation is we, we often get it wrong in the sense that inflation, we usually describe it as prices rising. And, and it's like we're, we're rowing up to an island and we say, look at the island rising up out of the water. And they No, that's not what's really going on. It's the boat is sinking. And because the boat is sinking, it looks like the island is rising out of the water when we're actually sinking into the water. And inflation is really a loss of purchasing power. And we'll use the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. dollar is losing its purchasing power against different things that we like to buy. That's one way to look at it. That's general inflation. But when we get into the complexity theory of it and the details, we do see that some prices really are rising. And it's not necessarily just that simple answer of the dollar's purchasing power is declining. But the thing you got to realize with inflation is, is I think this is the absolute truth. It, it is the silent tax. You think the silent tax, what are we talking about here? Well, governments actually like inflation. They, they think it's okay, especially if they tend to borrow lots of money, or we would say create a lot of currency. And so we could look at it this way. For example, for many, many years, when I started paying attention in 2008 and beyond, it was very common that our government and the Federal Reserve would talk about a target of 2% inflation. Well, what does that mean? It, what it really means is they plan to steal 2% of our wealth annually. That's the way I see it. And it's why I've never been a fan of inflation since I started figuring it out. So, oh, isn't that generous? They're only stealing 2% of my purchasing power by targeting a 2% inflation rate. And then what happened recently? Uh, oops, inflation is now 8%. Sorry about that. What's the translation? We're now stealing 8% of your, your purchasing power annually, 8% of our wealth on an annual basis. How can this even happen? Well, it all started back in 1971 when President Nixon took us off the gold standard. It used to be that countries could exchange dollars for equal value in gold. And countries started to get worried about us creating too much money against the gold we had. So they started repatriating their gold. They started taking it back. So in order to stop that, Nixon took us off the gold standard. So what did that, what does that really mean? 
it means from that time forward, money or what we call money, the US dollar is actually debt. There's nothing that backs it. It's a promise to pay sometime in the future. And so now money is debt. It's not backed by anything real and tangible. And because it's not backed by anything real and tangible, our governments can create as much as they want to. And lately, they've been doing a lot of that. But there are also two kinds of debt that you want to be aware of. There actually is good debt and bad debt. Bad debt is the kind that you have to pay for every month. It's a, it's a burden on you. Where good debt is when you acquire debt in order to get what I'd call an asset that generates income for you. So that's something to consider when we think about debt. It's not just all bad debt. There is good debt. And we, we love debt in inflationary times. And I'll explain that in just a few minutes. The other thing to be aware of that I think is really important is this idea of what we call macro analysis and micro analysis. When the 2006, 2007 financial crisis happened, I was coaching and Robert Kiyosaki was calling it out and he was telling us to get ready for this crash, especially in real estate. And I'm thinking, yep, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And it happened. And then I was just really frustrated because I didn't know why it happened. How did Robert Kiyosaki know that this was coming? And over time, as I dug deeper into this and started to study for myself, why did this happen and how did he know? I started to recognize that macro analysis is a big deal. See, our tendency is to think not only micro analysis, but we could even call it mini analysis where we're only worried about what's going on in our household, that that's our focus. M micro analysis is what's going on in our neighborhood, maybe even the state we live in. But then macro analysis is what's going on in the country, what's going on in the world that might be influencing what's happening to me and my financial well-being. So my macro analysis is also a big deal. The other thing I think is important to realize is that a lot of times you'll hear things like, uh, the government is providing this for free. The government is going to send out a, a stimulus check to everybody in the goodness of their hearts, blah, 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 blah. What are they saying? Government funded is really taxpayer funded. That has to come from somewhere, and it does come from the taxpayer. The government does not have a revenue generating source other than to collect taxes. And so don't buy into that one either that, wow, isn't that generous that they're giving this away for free? No, they're, they're putting that burden on you, me, and generations into the future. So this money creation that goes on, is, is that really a problem? And why does it become a problem and how does it influence, influence inflation? Now, I'm going to make this as simple as possible. And this is a super simple example. It doesn't take into all, you know, all the possibilities that cause inflation, but let's keep it simple so we can basically understand what's going on here. So imagine that we are a group of 50 people. And we're at a meeting together and after the meeting or sometime during a break there, we can go out and get a donut and everybody loves donuts in our group. And we, we happen to have $50 between, you know, everybody has a dollar and donuts cost a dollar. So we go out to the donut stand and uh, everybody knows that there's 50 donuts, there's $50 and everybody's fine. But let's say, there's a hundred of us and we all have a dollar. So now there's a hundred dollars in the system, so to speak, but there's only 50 donuts and a hundred people. Well, the first to get to the 50 donuts is, are probably going to be the ones who get, get a donut. All the rest of you are just out of luck. We ran out. But what if this happened? There's 50 donuts, there's a hundred people, but each of the people have $10. Donuts are a dollar, but there's, Every person has $10 and we know that there's only 50 donuts and, and there's 100 people, we all want donuts. Is there the possibility that someone might say, well, I'll give you five bucks for a donut. And then someone else says, well, I'll give you, I'll give you 10 for a donut because they have it available for the scarce resource in front of them. So when you hear the talk about you know, this money creation moving into the monetary system or into the marketplace, we could say, uh, when more and more money is pumped into the system, 
it's like the donuts. It's uh, more money chasing scarce resources. And so the possibility of prices rising simply because people are willing to pay more for the same thing because they have the money happens all the time. And that's a, that's a strong indicator of, of uh, too much money in the system and why that's a bad thing. The other thing to remember, too, is there's a lot often the talk is what we call the CPI index. Consumer price index is how they measure inflation. But it's actually affectionately referred to by a lot of us as the CP lie. Uh, originally, uh, I heard it from Mike Maloney. Uh, he wrote the book, The Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. And his original edition, it's on page 64. But he talks about the CP lie. And what he talks about is they don't measure the same things they did in the past. If, if uh, beef prices rise, they'll substitute chicken because it's cheaper. Or uh, they'll, they, they'll, well, one of the big ones was they, uh, they decided that uh, you don't really own your house. It's like you're renting your house. So they only use rental rates in order to determine the cost of housing in the CP lie. The big one is this one, and I don't know if anybody knows this or very few people know this, in the core CPI measurement, which they often quote for inflation statistics, they don't include food and energy because they say they're too volatile. What do you spend a lot of your money on? What are the few items that you need to survive? Food and energy. So those aren't even counted in core CPI. Another one I learned just not too long ago, I, I was actually surprised it never occurred to me, but somebody mentioned this one too. It doesn't include your taxes either. So when your tax burden goes up, guess what's happening? It's not really included in the inflationary numbers either. So how silly is this? All the things that are our most significant burdens are not even measured when they talk about inflation. So let's look at something that, can we say evens the playing field? I love shadowstats.com because one of the things they do there is they go through all the work to take their original basket of goods in measuring inflation back to 1990, use that same basket of goods in measuring inflation today. So they use the same measurement that was used in 1990. And what's interesting, this is the most recent look through January 2022. The inflation rate that has been talked about, the CPI has been around seven and a half percent. And you see that with the red line, about seven and a half percent. The shadow stats number based on the original basket is closer to 16%, just a little over 15%, almost double what they're talking about. So this basket of goods that keeps interchanging depending on what the government likes to put in there is really the CP lie. So when you hear inflation at seven, 8%, or it might be going higher to 10, you, you could almost double it. To, to know what's really going on. But here's another thing that I personally think about. Yeah, but my basket or my cart may not be your cart. So it's this arbitrary basket of goods, but what I buy may be different than what you buy. So we may actually be seeing that there are some prices going up and some prices going down. And this is where I think complexity theory from James Rickards is good to consider. So let's look at a possibility. Let's say the scenario is this. We have rising prices in food, gasoline, rents, utilities, uh, gold and silver. And let's say we actually see prices falling, falling in the S&P 500, just stock market prices falling, real estate values falling, uh, and maybe jobs and tourism are dropping as well. And so uh, vacations are on sale because nobody's going anywhere. That's kind of a possibility because that's exactly what I saw in 2008, you know, this, this, this shifting of some prices and others uh, where some were going down. So we gotta be thinking about that as well. And, and from a personal point of view, it's just looking at, well, what do I spend my money on? Are those prices going up versus what's going down? And my inflation number could be actually quite higher than somebody else's perhaps. Here's another thing that's interesting about inflation. 
the measuring of goods and services, there, there are uh, two big influences on that. And, and James Rickards brought this up as well. And he said, one is called the cost push scenario where the cost of the goods are going up. And so it's pushing prices up, but it could be that donut scenario where it's demand is high. And so there's more demand than there is supply. And so it's pulling prices up to meet demand. Think of uh, anybody who recently tried to buy a house in some of the hotter place, you know, hotter markets in the country. Um, I didn't have enough cash. Uh, somebody was willing to pay 10% uh, cash over the asking price. That would be demand pull. So we see both of those going on as well. But really, you know, that's it's nice to know that, okay, so there's lots of different ways in which inflation can be influenced. But what's the real question we need to ask? Who does inflation hurt the most? Well, it depends on how much your, your, of your income goes towards those most volatile expenditures. Unfortunately, right now, it is those necessary commodities of energy and food and housing. And if I were to say who's being the most affected right now by inflation, and who usually is most affected by inflation, it's the poor and the lower middle class. And so whenever these politicians are saying, we, we wanna take care of you, but then they turn around and create a lot of money, that's not helping the poor in any way, in my opinion. The other thing to be aware of too, is that it creates a scenario where savers are losers. And Robert Kiyosaki, all these years I've been coaching, he's always talked, savers are losers, savers are losers. and in the first few years of coaching, I thought, well, it's not that bad. You know, interest rates are in the three, four, five percent range in the bank. And if you look at what we call compounding, it looks pretty good. So let's take a, a five percent interest rate on our savings. Those days are long gone, but let's just do it anyway, right? So let's say I start with $100 in the bank and it's a 5% annual interest rate. So after a year, it, I've, I now have $105 because of I've earned 5% in interest. So now my 105 earns 5% and the next year it's 110, 25. And so on and after five years, my $100 turns into 121, 55. Because every year it's a little more of the, amount is earning interest. The problem with that, number one, is are we seeing 5% interest in the banks anymore? No, it's more like 0.5% interest. But what a lot of people don't realize is, hey, inflation has that same gig going on. Compound inflation, how about this one? What if inflation is 5% per year and, and I put my money in the bank and uh, I'm earning zero interest, let's say it's zero. Okay, so my $100 turns into 95 after the first year because I've lost 5% to inflation. The next year, another five. And by the end of the fifth year, I'm down to $81.45 because of compound inflation. Now, the real situation is there is some interest being provided on my savings, half a percent. But if the inflation rate is, is 7.5%, okay, I'm only earning 5% in the bank, so I'm losing 7%. So you can see already that compound inflation is going to ravage people with money in the bank. It's, it's just awful. How about this one? What if there's rapid rising inflation? Is it better to own my home or rent my home? Well, part of that depends on what kind of debt I have on that home. If I have a fixed rate mortgage and it's not gonna change, then my mortgage payment isn't going to go up. And so as inflation rages and rents are rising, at least with my home, I don't have to pay a bigger mortgage payment each month. In fact, we'd look at this in a way that uh, it's the lender that's losing in inflationary times. How does that look? Well, it all has to do with fixed rates. So if I were worried about inflation in the future, and I've been thinking this for a long, long time. And so I've been all over getting fixed rate mortgages on good debt. I love fixed rate mortgages on good debt because as inflation goes up, my, uh, my loan payments on the debt that I have doesn't change. And so it's actually easier to pay off that debt as interest, uh, sorry, as inflation rages 
and I can increase my income from other sources, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So rapidly rising inflation, wouldn't it be even better if not only did I own my home, but I owned an apartment building as well, where I could uh, get on that escalator of inflation and, and uh, be able to raise my rental rates if I need to. That's a good thing to consider. It, you know, you think, well, that's tough on the poor people and those that are renting. That is true. But as costs go up and as uh, inflation rages, that's essentially what happens. But really, the bottom line is this. We need to look at all those things that are what I call real and tangible assets. Uh, there are paper assets that could go up in inflationary times. Real estate usually goes up in inflationary times. Precious metals and commodities, I wouldn't say always, but I haven't known when they haven't gone up in inflationary times. And if you're a business owner, you're not stuck with, I hope I get a raise. Instead, you just you just adjust to inflationary times because you own the business. The other thing to be aware of is what Robert Kiyosaki calls them the, the five G's. And I've added a couple other G's. So the five G's that prepare you for times when inflation is raging are to have gold or precious metals, gas if you can store it legally, ground to grow your own food, grub, food storage, guns to protect yourself. Those are the five G's that Robert talks about. Then I like to add a couple more. I think it's important that you know who your neighbors are and you have good relationships with your neighbors because you may need to have to work together when uh, tough times come, maybe an infrastructure issue or, or some reason that the stores are out. Uh, you may need to pool your resources with your neighbors. And then uh, for me personally, whatever your uh, personal beliefs are, I, I have a, a belief in a higher power, so I add that one as well. The other thing to be aware of is how do you get your income? There are actually three types of income that you could be creating. Most people know earned income, and we were talking about it earlier that the earned income people, the W-2 people, they don't even have any tax benefits. So they're getting hammered on taxes, getting hammered on inflation without any real way of being able to improve their situation, except to hope their employer is willing to raise their their wages. And that's hard to do in inflationary times because employers are trying to hold down their prices from the push in the demand side of, of inflation. If you could generate passive income from real tangible assets, that's a great way to go. You have more control over adjusting to inflation as well as portfolio income potentially. Uh, Christine has written a book. She's talked about uh, if push comes to shove, perhaps down the road, she could raise the the cost, uh, what it would cost to buy the book. And if inflation is raging all around, most people wouldn't see that as anything uh, that's a problem. And it could be that the costs of producing them go up as well. The other thing is earned income is really all about trading your time for dollars. And here's one thing we all understand. There's only 168 hours in a week. And if you're already working a lot, are you going to get the second job and the third job? And you're, you're going to reach a point when you're, you just run out of time. You can, I even call it safely work that much. And so you're, you're, you're tapped out. You're, you're topped out when it comes to how many hours in a week you can work if you were to just get another job, get another job. So what can we do differently? Well, one thing I would recommend is that you start thinking about creating value. Can I create something that can become an asset that generates income? In network marketing, it's just simply creating your network marketing business with the help and support of the company that you join and building that into something of great value. Another way to look at it is this, and this comes from something that may be familiar to you, what we call the cash flow quadrant, and it's how you're able to control your income. How much control do you have over your income? So I put this little chart together that having multiple streams of income is a good idea, but I don't think all incomes are created equally. At, at the bottom, when it comes to the amount of control you have, I have the E quadrant or the employee. The next one up, the self-employed, because again, you're working your own company and eventually you're going to run out of the time you're able to work. So you, you kind of tap out there. 
So really the next one is, uh, it, it could be the business owner or the, or the investor. And I couldn't make the chart equal, but I think it's, it depends on you and what your talents and interests are. You could be business owner, you could be investing in different types of things like real estate or, or, or whatever it is, uh, precious metals, commodities, and so on. So I think those are somewhat equal depending on your, your temperament and what you know about. But it really is a nod to what we call the cash flow quadrant. And I always think of the cash flow quadrant in this way you're only as free as your options. And if I only have the E quadrant being an employee, that that's not good. So I had to look at the S quadrant, building something of my own, building it into something that can turn into a, what we call a B quadrant business where it generates income for you. And this is, how else can I say it? It is the classic network marketing scenario. You start a network marketing business, you build that business, and pretty soon you have residual passive income coming to you like a B quadrant business will. And then as you generate more and more income, instead of just living uh, super well on that, why not add the I quadrant and invest in other cash flowing opportunities as well? So this is confusing and this is challenging. And uh, when I look ahead at what, what inflation might look like in the future, based on what I see, I, sometimes I wonder, should I even bother with this? Do I even have a chance? And I say, yes, you do. And yes, you should. And here's why. This is from um, Chris Martinson and the Peak Prosperity uh, website. Uh, great stuff. Anyway, he talks a lot about the, the threat level chart. And it's uh, it, what is the probability something might happen and what would be the impact to you if it does happen? The higher the probability and the higher the impact to you, the more important it is to do something about it. So let's plug in inflation. What's the probability we're going to see high inflation? I felt like in 2008, it was coming. And there, because of complexity theory, and I simplified it too much, I didn't see what some of the influences were that, that made it so that it wasn't so bad then, because two trillion was created for the bank bailouts. Now we think two trillion, we did that just in one round of COVID uh, rescuing. And, and we've gone way beyond the trillions. Now we're seeing a different story. We are seeing that inflation is happening. The likelihood that it will continue, I would say, is high probability. The impact on you and me. Well, you got to think about your basket of goods and what prices are going up. You know, what is the purchasing power of your dollar doing? And it is it in those areas where you need that? I would say for most people, the answer is an emphatic yes. It's energy, it's food, it's housing. Those are the things that are being, critically, being hit hard because of inflation. And so if it's high and high, then the threat level is critical. So I would say, yes, do something about it because it's going to impact you tremendously and it's here already. So. How can we gain the advantage against this dragon we call inflation? Well, it's pretty simple. It's fill the asset column. In other words, you should have the things that we count as assets. They put money in your pocket or protect your purchasing power. Starting a business is an asset, especially if you have a lot of control over the income it creates for you. Uh, Richard talked about gold and silver. That's one of those no-brainers for me, but you've got to figure it out for yourself. Should you be thinking about the seven G's? Absolutely, because all of those are getting harder and harder to purchase. Uh, not able to do it with the same dollars we had a year ago. They're losing their purchasing power. Those prices are rising. Should you think about fixed rates while we still have fixed rates? If you can, I'd say do that. Debt is a two-edged sword, so be careful of that one. But if you if you understand it and can use it to buy assets that create cash flow, then uh, that's a great one if you can get a hold of those fixed rates. And then remember the control of income. It's found in the B and the I quadrants. It starts in the S quadrant. It's not in the E quadrant. It's not in the employee quadrant. I think when it comes to somebody wondering if they should start a network marketing business, I cannot think of a better time to start to take control 
so that you can be on the offensive when it comes to inflation instead of the defensive. And when you do that, you get on top of inflation instead of being buried by inflation. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Christine, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, this is absolutely awesome. If you want to take off down your screen, yep. this is, I'm so impressed. You know, I, I think what I'm impressed most is because of the fact that it is such a simple, easy to understand the way that you put it step by step and the importance of definitely be prepared. I love the 5G, the 7Gs and yeah. the two that you added with that. Richard, what's your take on this? Well, I'm biased towards open uh, home-based business on the tax advantages. Yeah. <laughs> but and it's not say, measured in inflation. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say a second... A very close second would be inflation. You know, with inflation going at seven and a half to eight percent this year, not counting food and energy. Okay, yeah. How, what else are you going to do? Is are you going to get a ten percent pay increase from your W two job? I don't think so. You know, Chris had the little basket of shopping carts. How it affects you differently. Okay, for example, where I live, I live. In a very rural area, okay, our nearest Walmart's over 100 miles away. If you go to a sports uh, event, basketball, football, things like that, our nearest high school is 70 miles away. So to us, gas is, is pretty important. Well, a couple of weeks ago, it was a Tuesday evening, I drove past the gas station. Gas was 3.37 a gallon. I drove past the next day, it was 3.69 a gallon. <laughs> that's a 10% inflation rate in less than 24 hours. Yeah. And so, so yeah, what that another big reason for having multiple streams of income, having control over things is how else you can keep up with inflation. Well, and I absolutely love um, the books of the Robert Kiyosaki, you know, the rich dad, poor dad and his uh, cash flow quadrant. But I also love the fact that we have experts right here with Richard, with you and with Chris Lashemanon. I just um, I feel like we're in good hands. And that's why uh, Monday night is really important with with it coming about. It's all about the business. Now, when you say a, a diversity with your portfolio, uh, we have let's let's get into that a little bit. What would be a good diversity? Um, any of you? Well, I, I think about there, there are really four asset classes. There's that one slide and I kind of blew through them pretty quickly because of the time uh, constraint, but, but it could be real estate. It could be paper assets, the stock market. It could be business ownership. It could be precious metals or other commodities. And so it's all of those. And, and I, I just, uh, it, it's, it's frustrating when I hear somebody say, oh, you need to be diversified in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That's not diversification at all. That's one asset class, that, and they all tend to move together in, in one way or another. So diversification is being in a lot of different ones. And that's why I love the control that comes with business ownership in mm -hmm. network marketing, with uh, real estate, potentially, and, and with uh, when I decide I'm going to buy or sell precious mm -hmm. metals. I'm not into other commodities because I don't get it, <laughs> but precious metals, I get those. And so I love that one too. That's what I think about. Now I have some facts uh, that I thought were pretty interesting. It shows that one in 13 Americans for, in some way in the part of their life, they have been involved with network marketing. One in hmm. 13. Okay. It shows that 6.2 million are actively involved right now. And this is in the USA, Americans. And then it shows that I, I asked worldwide, it said that it's a $34.4 billion industry, and that was in 2018. Mm. So, I mean, that's huge. And then also 66% of the MLM participants, they invest less than $1,000 to be in business for themselves. So let's talk about that. Yeah. We know how much it is for franchises. Let's, let's throw some figures out what it is for a franchise. <laughs> Well, I've heard that it's a million for a McDonald's and they don't even sell one to you now unless you already have one. They're that selective. Uh, yeah. 
just to get started. Uh, you know, some of them are cheaper, but yeah, it's cheap to get the franchise, but then you need to do the build out of your physical location, which can be in the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. Network well, marketing? Yeah. And it, well, gonna, bucks? Yeah, yeah, I want to jump in, but you have all the inventory, you have the employees. That's a whole nother world. I had somebody, yeah. they, they got their business loan, they have a beautiful franchise pizza place, and they didn't know how to deal with their employees. And so they came <laughs> yeah. and they went and it went very fast. Yeah. So, and then it was bringing a family in to do. So there's all of these things where in network marketing, a home-based business, and I think you can vouch too, Richard, that you definitely, it you own yourself, it's you, you're, you yourself and you <laughs> to yeah. make it work. And you don't have to worry about all that other stuff because the company takes care of the inventory and everything. Well, and you mentioned uh, the aspect of employees. I often tell people there's one thing worse than being an employee, and that's having employees. <laughs> with, with, I want to with tell a secret. There was um, there there is nonprofits for businesses. When I was a single mom, I had my own business in my home. It was not network marketing because I didn't know about it, and uh, and so I went for some. It's it's score. And yeah. it's where mm -hmm. retired executives are in there to volunteer to help businesses and and uh, with their things. And so I had a, I had a gentleman that was selected because I, I had a couple of employee situations and I didn't know how to handle it. And uh, so when I first met this gentleman, a excellent executive of a major college, okay, and and his first thing uh, after I mentioned my dilemma. He said, oh, I'll never work with employees ever again. <laughs> I thought he's not the one that's going to help me. <laughs> so that's a fact. And that's why I just discovered the home-based business a couple of years ago. And I wish to heck I had this, you know, long time ago because yeah. of those benefits. Well, in direct sales, network marketing, you know, Robert Kiyosaki Saki would classify a business the business side of mm -hmm. 500 employees. Right. Okay. Well, direct sales, you can have the benefit of working with 500 people or more, but without having to hire and fire and train and do all of that stuff. So for me, it's a good way to get on that right side of the, of the cash flow quadrant in that B triangle without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for franchises, for buildings, for hiring employees, all of your overhead, you're still over there. But you've got the support of you know, lots of times uh, multi-billion dollar companies, <laughs> you know, uh, to run that all. Well, and the free education too. Now I paid a lot of money for student loans to get my marketing advertising degree. And it was something, I didn't finish the degree, but I had enough to go as a single mom to go to work and get a good paying job. But what happens is I had to pay that back. Yeah. And so that's why I absolutely love the free education. They have it all to make sure you are successful because their success is your success and you do not have to pay it back. You just make effort. <laughs> <laughs> and, and growing that one other thing that I wanted to mention was employee compens um, all the compensation of the, the taxes you have to pay. Uh, let's name some of those when you're in business for yourself or a regular company, there's workman's comp, you know, there's this and there's this and this and uh, these standards that you have to fit. And I was just such a relief that with a home-based business, it's you, yourself and you, you know. Pretty much. Well, yeah, one yes. of the, you have oh. unemployment, you have workman's comp, you have social security, you have Medicare. If you mess up on those accidentally, there's huge penalties for doing them later, doing them wrong. Yeah. And the other thing too, is the W2 employee thinks uh, their take-home pay is, is their take-home pay. They don't realize that the company they're working for had to pay a bunch of their employment taxes on their behalf so they don't get it you know they they don't get those that benefit well they the company paid for it but they don't get the money mm -hmm. and so uh, uh the crazy thing is when you if you look at specifically at a person's financial statement that's in the an employee their biggest expense is probably taxes 
I, I love this conversation and I love the topic where it's all about the business. I want to say thanks so much, Richard Bruff, Chris Lewis, Shannon Manant, and uh, great, great info. I appreciate it. We're at the end of the hour. And so I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, thank Christine. You. Good night, everybody. <laughs> and so just uh, back, we had a, a slide on Richard. This is how you can get a hold of Chris Lachemonat. And um, his uh, number is right here. Just take a screenshot of this, use your phone and get a copy of that. And uh, as well as with Richard Bruff. And anytime you can go to nightatnight.com and you can email if you want this contact information with any guests that we have with uh, our weekly weeknight, Nine at Night. So moving forward, there is a book because I've been so new with network marketing, there is a book that has been created. Uh, newbie 101 for anybody brand new and it's from the network marketing from the inside out there is also that 25 percent of the people that start uh, stay in it the rest kind of fall out but I think there's a lot of reasons behind and uh, about it so this book is meant to be if you just joined you have nobody to help you or show you this will uh, give you the guidelines to be very successful and so uh, and I know that because I didn't have anyone show me and I, you bet I made mistakes, but created the right designs to make sure that um, the information there is for anybody of any company. So I sure appreciate that. So I just want to say thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, just stay tuned for each weekday night at nineatnight.com. You're incredible.